So for me, it's good morning, but I'm sure it's good afternoon and good evening to many of you. Uh, Roderick, thank you so much, you and your colleagues for inviting me and for a very gracious uh, introduction. Um, I'm really delighted, I have to say, perhaps unlike many of you, uh, when ENCODE began, I was uncertain as to how it might impact our own work. And I can tell you that beginning with some simple observations we made till today, we are bigger and bigger and bigger users of ENCODE than of probably any other resource. And I think it's really a remarkable sort of set of foresights by a number of people that uh, has led to ENCODE being so important in the work of not only ours, many, many uh, others as well. So I'm just going to really give you an overview. It's not a very long time, but as it should be. And I'm going to try to convince you that we are now at uh, really a new stage where we can begin to understand uh, not only regulatory control at the level of the sequence that many of you do, but how we can use what you do from molecules to the explanation of complex traits. I think for a very long time, as you know, the history of GWAS has been such that we've mapped, but mapping is not the same thing as finding the specific components and for explaining those components. So I'm gonna begin with a, a problem that many of you know that it's really about a hundred years ago that Ronald Fisher first proposed the idea that complex traits, multifactorial traits were not in violation of Mendel's rules but in fact arose from Mendelian behavior, additive behavior of alleles across many, many genes. The fact that many genes collaborated to produce a phenotype was in fact considered a very radical idea in those days. But by 1920, in fact, the work was not published in time because of World War I, Altenberg and Muller, Herman Muller, had some beautiful work in trying to dissect a complex trait in Drosophila called truncate wing into its multiple components, one on the X chromosome, two on autosomes, and he also showed, or they showed, that the X chromosome component was independent of the sex determining factor. So 100 years later, with the profusion of GWAS studies, we now know that Fisher was correct, that there are uh, genes and there are factors that determine uh, the behavior, additive behavior of traits across almost every part of the genome. And it spread more or less uniformly in proportion to the size of chromosomes. And so the question is, how does this become, uh, come about? And what is really its molecular basis? So in order to contextualize it more for my sake and the work, the way in which our work has proceeded, I'm gonna give you initially a somewhat more simpler example. And this came about through a study of Hirschsprung's disease, which is a phenotype of aganglionosis. And I'm not gonna, go through all of the slides in detail, you will have them and you can do that when you have time. But Hirschsprung's disease is essentially a disease of the absence of enteric ganglia. It's aganglionosis. It's a disorder of the gut in which a portion of the gut is not innervated. It doesn't have neurons. And so here are the layers of the gut. This is a transverse sections and it is these, this myenteric and submucosal plexus in which the, that comprises the enteric nervous system that is missing in a portion of the gut and sometimes the entire gut. And the question is, what are the developmental reasons? What are the genetic reasons why this cell type fails to develop? And there are many forms, short and long forms, depending on how much of the gut is affected. It's got variable frequency. It's about one in 5,000 in Europe or individuals of European ancestry about twice that frequency in Asians, and appears to be relatively rare in Africans, but that data is still not very good. It's been known to be multifactorial for a very long time. It's got about a 4% recurrence risk. It's got an altered sex ratio. And what drew me to this subject long time ago is that it had significant associations with single gene traits like Wardenberg syndrome or shaw wardenberg syndrome, with chromosomal changes, such as with Down syndrome. So that trisomy 21 um, individuals have a 50-fold increase of the risk of Hirschsprung's disease, as well as many other com complex forms. 
And there were some more or less Mendelian forms of the disease in animal models, in the mouse, the rat, and the horse as well. What really intrigued us in studying this disease, and I think I'm missing a slide here, but anyways, is that in all of the mapping that we did, in 2005, uh, uh, Eileen Emerson in my lab identified really to us a remarkable finding that explained the fact that even though we knew that the tyrosine kinase uh, encoding gene RET, which had mutations, coding mutations, RET coding mutations in about 15% of families, that even though we could show linkage to that region in multiplex families, we couldn't find a coding variant. And it turned out, this is from, as you can imagine from the time, not all of the sequences were available, that we eventually identified this non-coding element that showed high sequence identity conserved across most vertebrates, including all the way to zebrafish. And in fact, it had a sequence change that segregated in families. This is the segregation ratio with a very high frequency. This eventually we showed was an enhancer, an enhancer that bound SOX10. It was a simple substitution. It was very frequent, 24%. These are control frequencies, 24% in Africa, nearly absent in, I'm sorry, in Europe, nearly absent in Africa, about 45% in Asia. And it was an enhancer that was specific to dorsal root ganglia as well as the gut. So we were excited, excited because this was the first example of a common polymorphism disrupting a non-coding element that was a gut-specific enhancer and leading to loss of this cell type. We now know from many other studies, some recently published last year, that there are many kinds of genetic elements that lead to Hirschsprung. There are at least four distinct enhancers that do it in RET and in type three semaphorins. There are two dozen coding genes in which there are rare mutations that lead to this disease, as well as nine very large CNVs, one that includes, of course, trisomy 21. Here are the frequencies in cases and controls, but I want you to focus on the odds ratio. Even the enhancers taken cumulatively, when we count the number of pathogenic alleles, has an odds ratio of 4.5 and explains about 44% of the risk. Coding genes do, CNVs do, but they're much rarer in the population. They have much higher individual risk, but by virtue of being less rare, they explain much less of the disease. So there are all of these components, and our question was, are these components all unrelated, or how were they related to one another? And through a number of studies, all recently published in the last few years, we now know that at least 10 of those factors um, at least 11 of the factors um, sort of listed here, they are related to each other through a gene regulatory network. This has been done in both mouse cells and human cells. This has been done in mouse models of disease, of Hirschsprung's disease, in human patients, in human embryos. The data are very robust. There are a series of transcription factors, in fact, controls the expression of two genes in these neural crest cell derivatives. One is RET, there are these three transcription factors, and these three transcription factors with two in common, GATA2 and SOX10, control the related endothelin type B receptor, re related in function in what it does. Both of them are very strongly epistatic, but there are other features, other genes, its receptor, its ligand, its co-receptor, its signal termination, all of which in fact, the genes encoding these proteins, the RED really means they have coding mutations. RED has three non-coding mutations and three enhancers. But the importance of the gene regulatory network is that it emphasizes the importance of the non-coding genome. These genes regulate each other transcriptionally, and so they must be enhancers through which they act. Here's RED itself. I don't have to tell this audience that there are various kinds of data we can borrow from ENCODE as well as do some studies ourselves. There are a variety of en enhancers in this uh, topologically associated domain that contains RET. There are specific ones in, that we've identified on, by virtue of conservation or having known that they exist in ENCODE. And then we've shown them by luciferase assays that they can act as, at least in vitro, as cis regulatory elements or enhancers. There are 32 we know at RET, 10 of which we know 
not only contain a sequence variant that's associated with Hirschsprung's disease in the population, but they also show allelic differences at the level of the two alleles having different luciferase activities. We now, we know I'm going to speak a little bit about these three that are starred. They exist in three LD domains, so we know that they genetically are more or less independent. And we know that they bind those three uh, transcription factors that I spoke about. They bind GATA2, they bind SOX10, and they bind RARP. So here are three transcription factors that regulate the activity of three enhancers that regulate the activity of RET. So this is a very pleasing example. We know there's still features of this that we don't know. We know that the, uh, we know that the gene regulatory network is far bigger and we're doing a whole sort of studies, genetic studies by gene perturbation, by doing siRNAs, by doing CRISPR to find out what all of them are. The point I wanna make is that what this has allowed us to think through in the genesis of the disease is even though we know what we know, we still have a long way to go. For example, sequence changes may lead to compromise enhancer function. That's insufficient, maybe insufficient to cause disease or a phenotype. It may require local chromatin structure and function changes, so we need to measure those. It will then affect gene expression. We know the three enhancers do, the variants do affect red gene expression. Then it changes protein gene expression, not exactly one-to-one, -one, but meaning not exactly proportional, but at least one-to-one. -one. That leads to changes in the gene regulatory network that we've already demonstrated. That leads to changes in cellular function and eventually phenotypic variation. So we've got to follow this chain, this cascade of molecular events. And the way we are now doing this is collaborating with my colleague at NYU, Jeff Booker, to use big technology, big DNA technology, that is, we're going to model 150 KB red locus where we can put in the enhancers we want, the human coding sequence with sequence variants that we want to follow through all of these aspects to find out what does it take to really lose these cells. Well, Hirschsprung is fine, but we are all interested to see how far can we push this paradigm. So I'll tell you a little bit, as I promised in my abstract, of using these kinds of systems to understand the cardiac system, primarily understanding blood pressure. So much of the work here is the work of uh, Dong Won Lee, who got his PhD with Mike Beer, that many of you are familiar with, did a postdoc over a number of years with me, both at Hopkins and NYU, and now has an independent position at Boston Children's and Harvard. And he's the person who drove this through at least those, both Mike Beers and my lab, and it, in fact, incorporates uh, other ideas in the field, including uh, there has been similar work by Christina Leslie and others. So I'm not gonna describe the model here, except to say it's a machine learning model. It uses support vector machines to try and distinguish the sequence features of regions that we believe are enhancers or we know are enhancers versus those that are not. And this can be done, the trick here in fact, is to consider enhancer sequences through a library of KMERS and to attach weights to them. And it is this library that can, in fact, the KMERS can have gaps that in fact is the defining feature of, define, uh, defining feature of these cis elements. What happens with a model such as this, it is essentially a model of how enhancers can be defined in any given tissue is that it allows us to predict what happens when there are sequence alterations. And again, this is published work, which is why I'm not gonna mention this, uh, discuss it anymore, is that when we have a sequence variant, we have an objective way of saying whether it's going to compromise enhance a function in any way that then can be addressed by using a whole variety of both in vivo, in vitro, and other methods. So we started this uh, initial work. The initial work is published on human cardiac enhancer maps in which we took uh, the whole idea of doing this. And you might think of this as taking data from ENCODE and other studies and making combined maps. And the reason to do this is the empirical observations of enhancers, of course, are not comprehensive. There's variation signal intensity. There's variation in the depth of sequencing across studies. 
the protocol differences in the kinds of assays we may use, DNA-seq for some, EFAC-seq for others, even in DNA-seq, there are various uh, different protocols. And of course, there's a stochastic nature of the chromatin state during recovery of the samples for analysis. So here's a sort of summary of all of the data. And it did five samples, some from us, three from ENCODE. The CREs were defined by 600 nucleotide elements with a collection of 11 MERS allowing mismatches. We observed in quote about 160,000 such cis elements, but having a model, we could also predict 88,000 that should have been observed, but were not. And we have to test, of course, whether they are real or not. The interesting thing is these CREs that were predicted and not quite observed, observed only in one, were those that had weaker signals. They were relatively more cell type specific and they tended to map more to repeat sequence. And which is why I think mapping them off it can become difficult. But there's a whole variety of data that we use to show that they are in mass real. And what we also showed by having this L uh, KMER signature is that the whole variety of cardiac expressed uh, transcription factors were the ones that would potentially bind these elements. And we identified 334 such factors uh, that belong to 35 different transcription factor families. But importantly, we discovered or rediscovered all of the key cardiac transcription factors that are known. That is the GATAs, the MEFs, the MITFs and such. So we are now working on this with uh, an additional number of samples, both males and females, and having geographically different samples, that is cardiac geography, by looking at the right atria, and the ventricles, and the interceptal defects, and so on. And um, that, that's for another day. I also want to point out that these maps are not interesting because uh, they give us only a global view. Of course, it takes work. But for any specific value, like the most important sodium channel for, for cardiac phenotypes, SCN5A, mutations that lead to Brigada syndrome and to QT modulation, we have identified from this kind of work a series of CRE variants that we believe are causal because through a variety of assays that we've done here uh, on the right, and they're causal in the sense that they can recapitulate gene expression in the heart that's taken from human, uh, human tissue. And of course, newer data, for example, in looking at allele-specific expression has been very, very helpful in discriminating these specific signals. So here, um, uh, at least in my mind, this is proof uh, of principle, at least, that for specific genes, we can not only map the enhancers, find sequence variants, but also identify which ones are the most likely causal ones. So what I'm gonna to do today in the last uh, 10 minutes or so is very quickly try to tell you where this kind of maps may lead to with respect to blood pressure. So here we've recently uh, done this analysis uh, with Dong Wan and this is looking at, we are now looking at four blood pressure relevant tissues. There are many tissues that contribute to blood pressure, which is why studying its genetics become complicated. So here we've taken data from ENCODE uh, that comes from the adrenal gland, that comes from the heart. We also have data from the heart, as I showed you, from the tibial artery, as well as from the kidney. These are data sets we've generated. And here I've listed which are the ones that are available. And at the bottom, I'm gonna describe a QC procedure of the ones that we've used for making maps. Now the reason, um, there are two important features here that I should point, point out, that when we combine databases, like we did in the previous example, we gain much greater power because we get a larger number of enhancers, we get a larger number of higher quality enhancers, and there's actually added benefit in having different type of data sets. And we've done in a limited analysis that having DNA-seq and attack-seq and also having, say, K27 acetylation data, the different kinds of molecular ways in which we can define cis elements, in fact, add to the power of the heritability analysis I'm going to describe. The problem with many data sets is that we really need to do some assessment 
as to what the relative quality is. And quality can differ because of a whole variety of reasons, technical reasons such as some tissues keep well after autopsy, others don't keep well, some. Uh, but anyways, is issues such as that. And this method, this is from uh, uh, Yong Han and, and Dong Wan Li is, this is really geared to the fact that because there's variation signal intensity in the CREs that are observed, one of the things you can do is to rank them. And if you rank them, then you can take various, say, percentile sets of them, or thousands of them or in units of 5,000, and you can basically fit these kind of machine learning models to each set. And of course, there's no doubt that signals that are very intense, we can learn the features much better than signals that are far weaker. And uh, so this is a kind of scoring that's been done, which is the reason why we only selected some of them. And here, what I'm showing you for only one here, the adrenal on the x-axis are the rank of peak subsets in units of 10,000. So you have the first 50,000 peaks, the next 50,000 peaks, the third, and so on. And here is, with cross-validation, here's the, um, the area under the curve. And what you see is that we've, in fact, for this analysis, arbitrarily, arbitrarily taken the first 50,000 peaks that some data sets, in fact, behave far, far better than others. And there could be a variety of reasons for that. And we've now done this for the adrenal, for the tibial, to give us some idea of the endothelial component, the heart, and the kidney. So here's uh, sort of a summary of that data. Uh, that is, here are the four tissues. Uh, here's the number of cis elements that could be identified, and here's the total number. Of course, as all of you know, there's overlap between them, which is why they just don't add up to 500,000. Here's the typical length. The typical length turns out to be more or less the same, and here's the genome coverage. Each individual uh, tissue, uh, we get about coverage of about 10% of the genome in these cis elements, but combined, it's about 20%. So you've got to remember that we are using information on one-fifth of the genome to try and understand what genetic variation means. And um, here's some clues as to how we've done these annotations. So the first thing uh, to notice is that um, this was actually quite interesting. As you can imagine, this is just a complex Venn diagram of the four tissues to show overlaps in where the enhancers or cis elements lie. And you will notice that the ones on the top are the four that are found only in that tissue, tissue specific for this point. So they are roughly about, anyway, somewhere from eight to say 16, 17%. And they, and they are these four numbers. Then there's this class of 16 and a half percent that's common to all four you will note that the number that are found in pairs and triples is actually a much smaller number. So it looks like these cis elements are either tissue specific or they are common. That is, they are much more widespread. Now, I understand that when you look at tens of tissues, uh, some of this, I think, subtly will change. So the question is how much do these cis elements contribute to blood pressure heritability? So we took all 1%, bigger than 1%, that is polymorphic thousand genome variants. We got UK Biobank summary statistics, which can use, which we can use for both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. This is over 350,000 people or more. And what one can do is this partitioned heritability analysis. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically this has now turned out to be a very reliable standard way in which we can ask and estimate the fractional contribution to heritability of any class of elements. Now the SNP heritability, the phenotypic heritability of systolic blood pressure, which I'm only gonna talk about systolic today, diastolic results are very similar as I say, is about 30% or 25%. The SNP heritability that we can measure from that phenotype is about 14%, is about half of that. Uh, where of course that other uh, half heritability is, there are a variety of explanations, but as you know, most GEO studies when done across the genome recover about half of the phenotypic variability. So here are the tissues combined. So we can explain about two thirds of the heritability. So this is a fraction of the total heritability. 
So here are the individual heritability in all of the slides I'm gonna show you, and then the standard error, and then an enrichment. Uh, enrichment in the sense we are explaining two thirds of the heritability by using 23% of all sites. So that's an enrichment of about close to threefold, and here are the p-values, that's highly significant. So that's what the overall results are. Now it looked to us in examining the data that much of the signal was actually coming from the artery. And this was done by taking these data and breaking them up into seven groups. The four individually uniquely open, they are marked in red. The artery and other tissues that are in purple. The non-arterial tissues that are in green, and then all tissues, which is in yellow. And some of it's the same figures that you've seen before. We can now take these categories and we can repeat the LD score enrichment analysis. And now what you find is that overall, of course the results don't change, but the really significant results now come from those that are in this arterial segment. So that's only 4% of all SNPs that explains 17% of the total heritability. This is highly significant. This is the common part. Remember that this classification that I showed you on the previous slide is in non-overlapping segments of cis elements. So artery does a significant amount. The common ones do a significant amount. Uh, the non-arterial tissues, of course, contribute, but it's a much less significant amount with, uh, of course, comparable enrichment, but it's much less significant because it use, explains much less of the heritability. So a further thing that we could do, you remember I told you that because in having a machine learned model is you can now predict what happens to the sequence variance that we've considered. So on the left is the figure that I've showed you. On the right are those same cis elements with the same variance, but using only those predictions by this method called Delta SVM, which is just a score differential. It's just a difference in the SVM to speak to which ones are likely to have an effect. And what you find is that the effect of the total, that is cis elements that are found everywhere is actually small. And most of the effect is from individual tissues. And that suggests that even when these cis elements are open in multiple tissues, they exert the effect in blood pressure, at least in this example, primarily through only one of those tissues, either the heart or the kidney. And this is really summarized here. Uh, again, the same kind of data. It shows how uh, fractions of, SMI, um, of SNPs. So this is less than 1% in each of these cases. Now, by the way, overall we do better. We are now using about 5% of the SNPs, not 23%. And we can explain about a third of the heritability. And what you find is fractional contributions that are highly significant of which the arterial component is the most significant. Heart only, adrenal only, of course they contribute, but it's much less significant. So it suggests that much of systolic blood pressure heritability, at least as estimated here, is likely through an endothelial component. This is not a radically new idea, even though geneticists have said most of the evidence is through the renal system. I wanna just end by saying that you know, these kind of maps can be uh, constructed and used from all the other epigenetic marks that people study. And I think this is gonna be important because eventually this will allow us to build a quantitative epigenetic regulatory code, which actually has turned out to be very, very important and will turn out to be, be more important for study of complex diseases. I have a whole host of people to thank. I think I've uh, spoken about Dong Wan's work and his recent postdoc, uh, uh, Xiong, but many other people have helped with collection of tissues, collection of families, analysis. And there's no doubt none of this would have been possible in the absence of ENCODE and recently also the data from GTEx. So thank you very much. Um. Thanks a lot, Arvinda, uh, for your for your great talk in this video of the quantitative epigenetic regulatory code. Um, we have a few questions already on the Q, Q and answer. I I forgot to mention that you can actually ask the questions while uh, while the speaker is 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 speaking, right? Because they are registered. And, uh, 
people can upvote them so that uh, if we have questions that we need to prioritize, we will do it uh, according to the preferences of the people for, for the questions. So uh, I'll start with the first question by, by Ross Hardison, which is the following. When you use a sequence-based method like GSK, SVM for quality control, it seems like the assumption is that direct binding to motif is higher quality. Are you concerned that you may be removing peaks, data sets, that reveal indirect binding, for example, when a transcription factor is part of a complex? Yeah, I think, I think uh, most of these, uh, I, I don't know whether the assumption is exactly what you ask, Ross. Uh, I think the question is, what is the sequence specificity? So it doesn't matter whether the binding can happen individually or, and of course, there are many factors that do so in a cooperative way. I think the main assumption here is that you have to have a sequence specific signature. The sequence specific signature doesn't have to be a uniform logo. It could have gaps. It could have many, many sequences that contribute to that recognition. But this is a way of learning what that sequence signature is. So uh, there's some merit to what you say, but it is not as extreme as you, as, um, as, as I don't know whether you're stating it, but it's not as extreme as one thinks. Thanks. Uh, the second question is for uh, participant, uh, a little names. Uh, Yes, okay, Ross Harrison is actually happy with your <laughs> good answer. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah. I guess that you can see the, you can see the chat. Yes, I can, uh, I can see them, yeah. So I can, of, I can answer this, uh, for yeah. the sake of time, I can answer some of these questions, which is that um, I don't want to take over your role, but whether enhancers are intergenic or intragenic, uh, uh, I actually haven't looked at it in a while, but of course the vast majority of the genome is uh, intergenic, and that's where most of them lie. Uh, they do lie uh, in, in, in intronic regions as well, and some of them, in fact, do overlap, you know, some, some coding exons as well. But the vast majority, I think, uh, are going to be intergenic, uh, um, intergenic and some, and then in introns. Um, the other, uh, I think the question, um, uh, the other question is uh, that is the enriched heritability with the combined enhancers uh, for blood pressure due to them being more likely to be conserved? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think one of the things we've learned about, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Paul Fritchick uh, speak a little later, which is that, um, you know, um, I think the short answer is no. There are enhancers that clearly act as very strong enhancers in the human that are not uh, conserved in, uh, that are not conserved at least in the mouse. And even in the Hirschsprung example that I mentioned, I mean, you could, you could take that human enhancer and stick it in the mouse or even in zebrafish and get it to work in assays on very, very specific cell types. So we know it can act as an enhancer but they don't. And that's presumably simply because of the turnover of these sites. Yes, there is actually, uh, again, uh, maybe I, I will just emphasize this. Please use the, use the Q&A to, to make questions, but there are some uh, participants that are asking questions to the chat. So let me, let me formulate the question that Jorge Ferrer has put into the chat. Thank you. Do you have any information whether the arterial signal is predominantly driven by open chromatin variants, variants in endothelial cells, smooth muscle, or other cell types? So right now we don't have them. Those are precisely the kinds of uh, experiments we are doing. So I think um, uh, right now we don't, but uh, we strongly suspect, based on a variety of other physiological data, that it's endothelial. Uh, but nobody's really done this level of experiment. So the benefit of ENCODE is that we can do these first sets of analysis to make our hypotheses more precise. So you can imagine, I don't know what the statistical power considerations are, but I think uh, given that more data phenotypically will be collected, uh, 
we can imagine having a canonical set of tissues first, which we will look at to say, here's a complicated trait, and uh, what tissues contribute to it. By the way, we've done other experiments of doing both positive controls and negative controls. When we look at arrhythmias, the signal comes only from the heart in exactly doing this kind of experiment. So we know that the analyses can be specific, but we need much more, much more experience. But once you get to a particular tissue, I think there's increasing levels of single cell uh, data and single nuclear data, which I think are also going to turn out to be useful to say which cell type. And uh, there, the answer I can tell you, even the classically in Hirschsprung's disease, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth. Uh, the canonical thought has been that the disease arises from loss of intestinal neurons. It's not quite clear that the defect in neurons is also mirrored by defects in glia. And in fact, there's a sub the major defect may be even earlier in, in fact, the progenitor cells for this phenotype. So I really expect these kind of studies to clarify where exactly the disease starts. So there are a few questions are still in the q and I don't know if you respond respond Benkat Maladi, the expression of the- Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. So the question is what we consider the expression of the TFs. Yes, I don't think any statistical method, any computational method is gonna work in, without being constrained by real data. So just as having a set of standards or a set of enhancers that we know work as enhancers help us to improve the model, there's no doubt expression of transcription factors have been very important uh, for us to say, these are the ones that are, you know, that are probably the factors that act. And then of course, we have to do specific experiments. So there is another question. Yeah, so uh, there's a question here that Delta SVM is based on machine learning. What do you think is the best training set are you concerned that depending on the training set, you get slightly different results? I think there's actually no doubt. I don't know that we have enough to know exactly what the best training set is, but our limited opinion says that one of the best is just going to be this allele specific expression. So you can imagine that if there are two variants that allele specific expression, simply because we can control the number of reads uh, and in a heterozygote, for example, if it could be an otherwise rare variant that in that individual, there can be enough data to uh, show the robustness of a signal. So I think that's going to turn out to be probably the best, but we've used others. We've used, for example, you know, not eQTLs, but DNAs, you know, QTLs and other kind of data. Uh, and um, so uh, I think we don't have enough experience to be able to say uh, that they won't vary, but I would think that as the data improves, we can answer that question much better. We still have time for a couple of questions. Uh, while we wait for maybe other participants, I have, a, have one question for you regarding the the Hinsbrook uh, disease. So you identify a number of protein coding genes, enhancers, and copy number variants that were related to the disease. You did not mention long non coding RNAs. I mean, there is a <laughs> yeah about the function of long non coding yes. RNAs. So you don't find any. And I like to ask you whether few things: whether you don't find any because they are not, whether this is specific of this disease, or is it general, or do you think that long non coding RNAs play a really small role in most uh, yeah sites? Yeah. So um, one observation that is very robust and has been bothering uh, at least us for a, at least a year is that we have done parallel studies in the mouse where we have far greater control, but we have uh, studies in human embryos as well collected through a resource in the UK called uh, HDBR that many of you know. Um, I think one of the things that's really very interesting is that the RET deficiency 
leads to changes in many, many uh, transcription factors. Uh, so not only does it affect many genes, but it affects many transcription factors. And so we've been puzzling over, we know the result is true. The question is how does a you know, receptor tyrosine kinase do this? And I think uh, we've eventually uh, sort of come up with the idea, the hypothesis that there is probably a long non-coding RNA involved. And the likelihood is that we know that RET affects its own transcription factor, SOX10. And at least there's some evidence that the SOX family of transcription factors, some of them associate very actively with a number of long non-coding RNAs. So I, I think um, it's gonna turn out that as we look at the interactions between these genes, uh, that uh, long non-coding RNAs in fact are rightfully will have to be considered as a global way by which they can change the regulation of many genes. Mm -hmm. So let me, if there are no more questions, I would just like to remind people that they can post questions on the Slack channel and at the end of the session we'll have a live uh, Zoom with, with, uh, with the speakers so that we, we can actually ask questions directly to them. I just want to ask you a very general question related to the question that has been asked to you. What, what do you think uh, in terms of the cell, uh, the, in which particular cell types the enhancers were active? What do you see is their, their role of single cell analysis and human cell analysis projects like that in the identification of the genetic basis of disease? So, um, you know, like, like many others, we are also doing so. Uh, you know, my labs, my labs, philosophy so far is whatever we do, we do in Hirschsprung disease first. Because if we can't explain it in that system, we don't know that it's even biologically going to be tractable. I think there it's, um, I, I think the single cell expression data has been, of course, very, very significant because, um, you know, the total neuronal uh, diversity in the gut is not really very well known. Um, attack seek data, at least in looking at trying to define enhancers using those kinds of open chromatin assays together with looking at say K27 acetylation, we, uh, uh, we have begun. Uh, and I think uh, our initial data suggests that we should be able to get cell type specific enhancers. The problem I think is gonna be how many we can resolve at this stage of the technology. That is finding the top hundred maybe, you know, uh, very easy. Uh, and that probably is limited by the actual nature of the single cells or single you know, nuclei that we can, uh, we can extract. We always uh, think that even in the mouse that we can dissociate cells and get a random sample of the whole tissue. And we just don't know it. And, and so I think this is just gonna be a technical matter we've got to solve. That is, do we sample enough cells and do we sample enough numbers of even the rarer cell types so that we can get, not for expression, but for open chromatin, we can get specific data on literally thousands of enhancers. We don't know that yet. That needs to be solved. 